Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start the last session of the day. And it's a, a very exciting one. This is the This is the first time that the Med Forum has been addressed by a Chinese speaker. And I think this is a, a recognition of the fact that China is emerging as a serious power in the Mediterranean. This Chinese dimension uh, is most obvious through the big Chinese investments which have taken place in ports, in Piraeus, in the Three Seas Initiative, in Italy, in Spain, in Algeria, in the way that China has become the biggest consumer of hydrocarbons for many of the uh, economies in the region, and in a whole series of Chinese investments which have happened or which uh, people hope for as part of the the monumental Belt and Road Initiative, which President Xi launched a couple of years ago. But I think even more important than that is the fact that there is a new global context which has emerged with the United States playing a very different role. And China is now also a central part of this question, not just about the future of, of global order, but also the future of globalization. So we're very lucky to have an extremely uh, distinguished Chinese diplomat, a scholar, an intellectual, but also a stateswoman to talk to us about the new role that China is playing in this context of these big global debates about the future of globalization. But she's also very happy to talk about the Belt and Road Initiative and to answer any questions which people have about China's presence in the region. Um, it's with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce uh, Madame Fu Ying, who is chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the National People's Congress of the People's Republic of China. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Very, thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, sorry to keep you a bit longer after this uh, long afternoon. Uh, but uh, after all those intensive discussions about the matters related to the Mediterranean, uh, maybe this round can be less tense. Uh, and uh, I was, I was uh, telling Mark before sitting here, I was a bit worried that uh, I'm a bit out of a place because uh, I'm not so familiar with the, the, the discussions uh, about the Mediterranean, so maybe I will talk in a more general way. But I want to first thank, uh, uh, thank the uh, ISPI, and thank the Foreign Ministry of uh, Italy and Italian government for organizing this uh, very important uh, dialogue. And having heard through the first time I'm here, having heard through those uh, very impressive uh, debates, I, I could uh, see and I do appreciate the importance of this uh, dialogue. And uh, this is a very important year for China-Italian relationship. Uh, the, the president of Italy visited China early in the year, and in May, the prime minister came to attend the Broughton Road uh, Summit in Beijing. Uh, the two countries, we have also signed a protocol about uh, uh, an action plan uh, for uh, 2017 to 2025 for, the, uh, for encouraging the cooperation in science, in economy, in culture, in many fields. So I'm very honored to be here uh, for this dialogue. And I think uh, there can't be a better place to discuss the important uh, issues uh, of the world today here, since uh, uh, Mediterranean is the birthplace of uh, uh, three uh, ancient civilization. It has generated, uh, uh, during the modern time, uh, lots of cultural science and uh, economic activities. In the meantime, it is confronted with uh, such difficult and complicated challenges of the day. Uh, so I I'm hope uh, that uh, I could contribute to the dialogue, but from a very different angle. I want to talk about how does China see the globalization uh, of the day uh, 
there are different views in the world today about uh, the pros and cons of uh, globalization. But I want to say that in China, most of the people think, most of the pe people agree that uh, uh, in the post-Cold War period, uh, glo uh, globalization, economic globalization has been the most important driving force for the economic growth, the fast economic growth in the whole world. The, uh, the world economy has grown more than three times uh, since the end of the Cold War, which has been quite unprecedented and uh, has lifted so many people out of poverty. Um, the, the world economy could have not been able to grow so fast without economic uh, globalization. And developed world, the developed countries, which uh, uh, were the first mover of globalization, has also benefited a great deal from uh, the process. Uh, China is one of the developing countries who, uh, who uh, captured the opportunity, has also uh, made very fast uh, growth. Uh, under the correct leadership of the Communist Party of China, and uh, after painstaking reform and uh, opening up effort, and especially with the dedicated effort of the Chinese people, China has now become the second largest economy, and people's living standard has uh, uh, greatly improved. I remember the first time I came to Rome was 1986. I was an interpreter for ILO, and I had only two two uh, uh, lira at that time for, for uh, uh, a whole day visiting, so I could only walk, seeing all the, all the uh, museums. But nowadays, you could see the Chinese tourists everywhere, everywhere in Rome, in other capitals of, uh, of uh, uh, Europe. And I, I, I couldn't have believed at that time that China would uh, develop in, in such a way, and people could uh, improve their living standard in such a short period of time. Uh, but uh, the globalization is also criticized for its flaws, and especially since uh, 2008, the financial crisis, uh, the world wealth and the trade has been shrinking, and the voices uh, against globalization uh, are rising. But uh, turning back is not an option from our point of view, because we believe that uh, the, the problems uh, uh, do not lie with the globalization itself, but uh, in the way it was pursued and also uh, the, its management. Uh, obviously, global governance has not uh, catch up with uh, uh, the fast pace of the globalization. And some of the, uh, the old uh, uh, the international order and the institutions are not coping with the uh, uh, changing situation, also the new challenges. Um, the good news is that over the recent years, there, is, uh, there has been growing consensus among countries uh, and growing awareness of the lack of a governance of the globalization, and there has been uh, strong efforts. For example, the creation of G20, the reform of IMF, and the formulation of the Sustainable Development Program 2030, as well as the Paris uh, Climate Change Deal. But, uh, what, uh, uh, but th this is not enough, we need to do more and we need to have a more balanced growth, better distribution, and also uh, in uh, renovative uh, improvement of the uh, current uh, international order and uh, institutions. In China, in October, the Communist Party of China successfully had its 19th Congress, uh, during which uh, there is a clear acknowledgement that the Chinese society has moved forward and that the task uh, uh, for us now is no longer just to grow the, grow the economy. Maybe in the past, uh, uh, solving hunger, uh, result, uh, result, uh, lifting poverty was enough, but now we need to uh, meet the growing demand of the Chinese people for better lives. So 
China has entered a new era, and the domestic policy focus of the party and of the government now is to achieve better balance in growth as well as a fairer distribution. As President Xi Jinping put it, we should pursue innovative, coordinated, green, open, and shared development. But China cannot pursue its goals in vacuum. We need to maintain a peaceful, external environment and to engage widely with the world for cooperation. And the Party Congress also calls for promoting new form of international relations and build a community with a shared future for mankind. And for improving global governance, China proposes to reform the system through communication cooperation and to achieve shared results. One example is the Belt and Road Initiative Mark you mentioned, and the essence, the key word for the Belt and Road Initiative is connectivity. China's uh, seven provinces face the ocean and are connected through the maritime route to the world market, and it's deep west where the next wave of growth may come can be connected to Europe through our western and northern neighbors. And the Belt and Road Initiative will bring into play China's unique advantage and make good use of its experience, its technologies, as well as the capital to bring more economic ties and trade to Eurasia and the world at large in order to st stimulate new growth. It's already achieved some results, and Italy is one of the early participants and signed a protocol with China and both Italy and China, uh, the government are encouraging the businesses to catch up with the opportunities. Uh, globalization in other field is uh, perceived in, with mixed feeling. Uh, I think uh, after 20 years, and I could uh, see from the afternoon discussions that uh, most of us agree that uh, the attempt to transform the world with Western values and the political system is far from achieving all of its purposes. And the new problems are added to the old foes. The negative result is still haunting some countries, leaving many people and families displaced. I think the lessons are profound. The, an ancient Chinese saying goes like this, sweet oranges grown in the south would taste sour once transplanted to the north. The orange trees may still look the same, yet the soil and the climate conditions have uh, changed. So the wise teaching that came down in history reminds us of the importance of respecting differences and not to impose on others. In the world security, international cooperation, I think, is still lagging, partly uh, because of the uh, structural obstacles. The US, the strongest military power in the world, has failed, uh, from my point of view, has failed to build an all-inclusive security framework after the Cold War. It prefers to take its military alignment as the pillar of the, world, uh, of the world security. And in Europe, when I was in London as an ambassador, the, the British like to emphasize to me that the alignment is the key and is the pillar of the world uh, security. But however, but um, as we all know, the alignment is based on an exclusive security approach, and sometimes even at the cost of the insecurity of others. I, for example, the US uh, uh, prioritized the interests of its allies in the territorial disputes in the East and South China Sea, while not willing to acknowledge the interests of China, which is not an ally. The Korean Peninsula is even a more unfortunate example. After the Korean War, the US stayed on, and the peninsula fell into confrontation over half a, more than half a century. Due to the deep mistrust between the US and North Korea, no peaceful agreement be it bilateral or multilateral, could be implemented. The US emphasizing its own security and its allies' safety has exerted mounting military pressure and calling 
for continued sanctions against the North Koreans, while the North Korea, hoping to achieve ultimate safety, speeded up nuclear and missile tests, resulting in a vicious circle of action and reaction. Now the world is witnessing a growingly dangerous uh, situation. So the world can be safe only when, I think, uh, only when all countries are free from threat and feel safe. And China thinking for security of a world community can be summed up into the following. One, common security, meaning to respect and ensure the safety of each and every country rather than some countries being safer than others. Two, comprehensive security, meaning taking both traditional and non-traditional security threats, uh, um, tackling both uh, non-traditional and traditional security threats. Three, cooperative security, meaning promoting common security through communication and cooperation. Four, sustainable security, meaning also to pay attention to development, which for many developing countries is the vital path to stability and security. And for China itself, it's very important to strengthen its defense forces to protect the country and the people and to handle security challenges that concerns China. And for international security, China mainly plays a role within the UN framework. For example, China is the biggest contributor to peacekeeping among five permanent members of the Security Council. And Chinese Navy has actively participated in anti-piracy operations of the Gulf of Aden. So to conclude, we live in a changing world and the international cooperation and situation need to keep up with the times. If, uh, if countries maintain a closed block or exclusive approach to security or stick to geopolitical competition, it will be hard to, for countries to form synergy in countering rising new challenges. And China hopes to see the world moving towards a community with shared future and the world should be a, there should be a common roof for all countries in the world and to share and not to divide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Fu. So we've got... <laughs> it, it's quite late in the day um, uh, and people have been working very hard, but I, I'm sure there'll be a few people who want to ask you uh, questions. We've got uh, about 12, 13 minutes for all of the questions. I might... Uh, just ask you one big question, which I think might be on a lot of people's minds, and then I'm going to invite other people to, to come in. My, my big question is, is about how China reconciles its growing presence in this region, its economic investments, with um, all of the security problems that most of the rest of the, the forum are talking about. You talked a lot about the problems with the American approach. We know that China believes in, in the principle of, of non-interference in internal affairs, the five principles of peaceful coexistence. Um, but we saw in 2011 when uh, Libya um, descended into to chaos that China managed to get 35,000 of its citizens out through ships um, in Benghazi, through airplanes in Tripoli. Um, and that was a kind of defensive reaction. But how, how is China thinking about its, its role as it gets inevitably more exposed to security problems, to political problems, to conflicts between different countries that it's trying to maintain a relationship within the region? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a good question. Actually, there, there is also debate in China about what role China can play in the world beyond our boundary. In, in terms of uh, security and uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, addressing the world uh, uh, hot issues. Um, see, China for the past de decades or more than a century, China has uh, suffered a lot from outside interference. So China is very sensitive. We, we believe that uh, if uh, you do not want uh, uh, things to be done on, onto you, you should not do the same onto others. So non-interference, I think, will for a long time to come to, to be China's, uh, uh, China's uh, fundamental principle. 
but uh, when we have Belt and Road uh, Initiative, we have projects uh, uh, on other countries' territories, what should we do? Uh, we, we believe that the countries who are interested, in, who, who are voluntary, volunteering about uh, for the project should uh, be able to provide security for, that, for those projects, so not for China. You've actually got a special military division in Pakistan defending the, 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 the Right, they yeah. build the division to yeah. protect the projects. I think uh, that's, uh, that's China, I would think China should be very careful uh, uh, not to, China should not copy some of the behavior of the powers in the past. The Chinese are using military, private military security companies in the same way that Americans that should be, did. In, that should in be commercial, places. I think. That should be commercial. They should be, should, should be operating within the framework of the law and the rules of the country's concerned. But uh, China as a country should not try to, we should not try to pretend that we're clever than others and can handle other countries' affairs. We shouldn't do that. I, Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes for, for questions. I'll take them as a single group and then come back to Madame Fu to, to answer them all uh, at the end. If people could put their hands up, um, is there a gentleman in the third row over here? If you could keep your hands up so that maybe mics can be given to other people while we're, while the first person's speaking so that we can get more in more quickly. Um, so there's a lady um, a bit further back, if someone could give her a mic um, for the next question. Uh, my name is uh, Jawad Kardoudi. I am the president of Moroccan Institute of International Relations. Uh, my question is the following. Uh, North Korea is a small country. He wants to have the nuclear, nuclear power. Don't you think that uh, it is better for this country to, to have a stronger economy than to have the nuclear power? And why China do not press the, the leader of uh, this country to, to keep to not to have nuclear power? Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lady um, in the middle row, maybe someone could give her a mic, but while we're waiting, this gentleman here with the blue microphone. Do you want to, to ask your question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm Musa Shtabi, Center for Strategic Studies, University of Jordan. My question is really about uh, Chinese role and perspective on the Syrian crisis. You know, as this is you know, about the Mediterranean uh, issues, uh, I know there is a special envoy, uh, Chinese envoy for Syria, uh, China is definitely um, um, involved uh, in, uh, in some perspective and behind maybe the scenes, maybe not necessarily, you know, so yeah, the obvious uh, role, but definitely is China is there in the Syrian crisis. I'd like to see your perspective on uh, the uh, political process yeah, uh, in Syria from a Chinese perspective and what role China is preparing to play in the post-conflict Syria. Thank you very much, madam. Um, hello, um, my name is Karadina Nitsa and I, I work in Pirelli, uh, government affairs. Um, my question is related to the Belt and Road Initiative in more specific detail. And I think a lot of people have argued that it's actually a security threat itself and that it constitutes um, a sort of new way of um, projecting economic power. And so I guess my question is, um, wh what is your perspective on that and how is the Belt and Road Initiative actually not a security threat but uh, part of this new vision that China wants uh, in security as a common security issue? Thank you very much. And uh, the last question in the second row from Jim McGann. Unless one more, oh. Okay, two more questions. Can someone give Jim a, a mic while she's asking her question? Yeah. Hi, I am Marion Felizola. I'm a student at ESP, and I wanted to ask you about how do you envision China's role as a potential mediator for the Korean Peninsula crisis, um, perhaps as stepping in 
to sort of fill in the gap that America is having as a, with, with the diplomatic issues. So how do you think China could take advantage of its diplomatic ties and its role in the area as a potential mediator for this crisis? Okay, Jim. Uh, Jim again, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Madam Fu Ying, uh, Xi Jinping has uh, mentioned think tanks more than any other organization since coming to power in China and at the One Belt, One Road mentioned it seven times. I would be curious as uh, to your view on the role that think tanks uh, play in China and in terms of uh, how they will uh, help China in uh, President Xi's statement of that China will be a strong actor in global affairs uh, coming out of the Congress. Thank you very much. So five big questions, four minutes and 44 seconds to answer them. Madam Fu, the challenge is yours. <laughs> okay, first about uh, uh, North Korea. Uh, 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 my, my question back to you is that why would they listen to us? Why? So the North Koreans would say, why can't you stop the Americans from threatening us? Why can't you tell them to stop having those military exercises paramount? Uh, uh, with paramount force in front of our doorstep every year or f a few times a year. Can you, can you somehow let us feel that we are safe, we are not under threat? And the U.S. would, uh, I mean, U.S. would think that they have the right to do so, but the North Koreans have no right to defend themselves. And China is not offering the umbrella for the North Koreans. We don't believe it's our, uh, it's, it, it's not our policy to offer an umbrella. So Japan thinks they are threatened, to South Korean think they are threatened, and North Korean say, would say that you have an American nuclear umbrella, and I'm outside the umbrella, I'm in the rain, so I want to build a, a way of, of self-protection. That's their argument. I'm not agreeing with them. I think uh, it's very important that we protect the, the, the non-proliferation regime. In the meantime, we think, I think there should be a, a way out for the North Koreans. There should be an offer for them. If, if they don't go nuclear, there should be other way out for them to be safe. Otherwise, if you keep on exerting pressure on them, they are going to, to, to they, are, they are more determined to go the wrong way. That's the problem. Uh, I hope you can persuade your Americans <laughs> ask the same question to them. On Syria, yes, uh, I think uh, China supports the political uh, path and we hope uh, uh, we hope that the situation will, will gradually sta uh, stabilize and uh, Syria one day could be part of the One Belt, One Road. And uh, after, after the war, Syria will need a lot of uh, reconstruction. I think China will have a strong role to play. Now about uh, uh, One Belt, One Road uh, initially being a threat, that's, that's, that puzzles China. Any, there, there are lots of comments like that, but the chi for the Chinese, how could building road being a threat? How could con connectivity being a threat? How could economic growth being a threat? If, if the, the Belt and Road Initiative is not martial law, it doesn't have a strategic objective, it doesn't have any security content in it. It's just economic development and the companies involved. China has initiated it, it so China will have more input, more Chinese companies will be involved, but then they're not going to do charity. Is for uh, is commercial and business relationship. Uh, if they invest, they will look after their their returns. So this this is a, a platform of economic cooperation, which we hope will stimulate new growth. It will help uh, uh, connect uh, Asia and Europe and wider area. So uh, I think the kind of double standard, the kind of a double, uh, uh, a kind of a a biased view of China is not helping uh, promoting understanding. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind if there is a good example of China threatening any country or any a, 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 through, through the connectivity of any region. Uh, China's role on Korean nuclear issue, we would like to mediate the talks, but there has, there has to be talks. The, the parties have to be willing to talk. That, that's our problem. I, I keep on uh, I keep on telling the people who, come, who came to discuss this with me, that everybody wants China to exert pressure on North Korea. North Korea is under huge pressure already. Who is going to exert pressure on the other party? 
And then there are two parties to the, one, to the problem. And the root cause of the Korean nuclear issue is uh, security, the security dilemma. So if, if we only, uh, only pressure one party without doing uh, the same on the other party, or at, at least lightly, <laughs> but there's still some pressure on the other party, it won't work. So uh, I think it's a, it's a very difficult situation. But I, I could see that some of Americans are also regretting not talking earlier, and this is so late. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope even if it's late, uh, still better than not starting uh, uh, now. About uh, uh, think tank, yes, think tank is, uh, I think China is uh, realizing the importance of think tanks, and uh, uh, the government, uh, the party, uh, really consulting a lot from think tank. The, the, when, when you know we have the five-year program, every five years when we make that program, it always started from think tank discussions. And uh, most of the major political reports, like the government reports for the Congress every year, and even the party congr Congress report, uh, uh, all, uh, 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 always, always involve lots of uh, uh, think tank contributions. But Chinese think tanks are uh, young, and uh, they are still learning. Well, thank you very much. You managed to, to cover all of those questions. But maybe you could join me in thanking Madam Fu. And um, thank you very much for, for working so hard today. I think this is the end of the, the first day, and I hope that we've started a new tradition of having a, a Chinese voice at the Med Forum. Many okay. thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the closing session of the first day of Rome Med. You are all invited to a light cocktail which is taking place at the ground floor here at the hotel. Thank you. <laughs>